Hi, Talking Cars fans. Want to join us for an episode of the podcast that we are going to record at the University of Michigan on January 7, 2017? Email me a short note by December 20th to talkingcars at consumer.org. Based on the responses we get, we'll select a limited number of people to attend. Sorry, but you're going to have to pay your own way for travel. As always, thank you for watching, and we hope we get to meet you soon. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Gabe Shanhar. And I'm Jake Fisher. On this episode, we're going to talk about two sedans that basically redefine their brands here in the United States. We're going to talk about the Lincoln Continental. We're going to talk about the Alfa Romeo Giulia. But first, the Continental. Jake, it's been like forever since Lincoln has had a true flagship. Yeah, sure. I mean, Lincoln has been kind of, I'd call them overgrown Fords, but they're not really overgrown Fords. They're just like Ford with different styling. Um, yeah, the MKS is not a convincing. Right. And I mean, the MKZ, I mean, they're, they're not bad. I mean, they no, drive The MKZ is nice. okay. Yeah. <clears throat> MKZ, cer cer certainly. I mean, you look at what, um, you know, Ford has done with Fusion. I mean, it drives really nice, and so does the MKZ. But this is really a big car. This is a flagship. This is a big luxury car. And I mean, I just, I was driving it last night. I'm like, this thing is quiet. This is roomy. It drives nice. The steering is nice. The interior pieces are really nice. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Lincoln's of your, you know, they were big and they were comfy and they were plush, but they didn't drive nice. And they didn't mm -hmm. have that interior quality that, that we see here. Yeah, I mean, like town cars, you know, <clears throat> they they were the top of the Lincoln lineup for a while, but there was nothing really refined about <laughs> town cars at the end. Right, so uh, yeah, Jake's absolutely right. I mean, this is the first Lincoln that doesn't have a Ford parallel in the lineup, not a direct parallel. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it's based on the Fusion platform, but that's a great platform to base just about everything on. Right. Uh, and yeah, the car is uh, really uh, comes across, I mean, it has a presence. You look at it, it has size it has uh, it looks it comes across very flagshipy mm -hmm. and yeah I mean it does everything it needs to do very well it's quiet it rides comfortably it's roomy I think it's a lot of people are gonna be happy with it. I mean with the 2.7 turbo it's got the grunt so it's much got power. Uh, I mean that engine very cool. effortless. That, that engine can pull around a 7,000 pound trailer with an f-150 right. it's gonna be okay with a Continental sure uh, you know oh, oh, but I miss the uh, the old uh, Spare tire in the back, though. Really? Yeah. No, 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 you don't. <laughs> um, I, you know, driving this car, I thought if I was a character on Goodfellas, if I was a made man, this would be the modern day car that I would drive. That is what this car is. It harkens back to the days of The Godfather and Goodfellas and Billy Joel song lyrics, where, you know, big American sedans ruled. You know, Chrysler Imperial. But it's not a Cadillac. Like <laughs> <laughs> that was well done. That was no, good. no, it's not. You know, it goes back to traditional American luxury. And there have been so many years where traditional American luxury hasn't existed anymore. Because, you know, look where Cadillac's gone. Cadillac is more Bavarian than BMWs. This is a traditional American car, but yet, I mean, it's not a sloppy road going couch. It's. Well, I mean, I, th I think an obvious comparison is the Cadillac CT6. Mm, so the CT6 is a big car with presence, but also they worked out all the other stuff. So, I mean, they did this with this, this Continental, and they did it with the CT6 too, that you get that large car presence, that huge trunk where you could put things in. Mm -hmm. um, but it also drives really good. I mean, this thing is something where you could hop out of a BMW or Mercedes-Benz and, and, and feel at home and the interior quality is there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's really kind of like flexing the muscles of the domestics saying, hey, we could do this stuff too. I don't know. Uh, I drove the Continental a couple nights ago and then I drove the CT6. I drove them back to back. They do feel very different to me. Very I different. mean, the CT6, yeah. listen, of all the cars we have here, and in fact, almost of anything I could possibly get, the CT6 is what I would pick to drive cross country. I adore that car. It is fun, it is comfortable, it is luxurious. This is competent, but it's more dialed back. It's more relaxed. It's more relaxed, yeah, definitely more relaxed. But I will say, I don't think you should compare the Lincoln and the Cadillac really uh, directly. I mean, there are other players out Why there. Why not, Gabe? Uh, you can, of course you can. But, <laughs> uh, but I'm telling you not to. Uh, there's, I mean, they're about relaxed traditional American luxury. I mean, you look at, uh, at Hyundai Genesis, for instance, or uh, the G90. 
these cars yeah, the G90s. Are, are really targeting that kind of uh, that kind of uh, place in the marketplace for, for a relaxed traditional American luxury without any like aspirations without like boasting about oh we do the number ring in like mm -hmm. eight, eight minutes seven seconds you know yeah so that's uh, you can't ignore these guys I mean they're new players but you know they 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 should be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. Well, so so I mean the Continental. I mean certainly the Cadillac is you know definitely tries to be more sporty and more you know all that, but it doesn't really give up anything. So the CT6 is kind of like you know it's still quiet and it still rides really mm -hmm. well, well. And certainly this is a little bit more relaxed than that. But in terms of like the steering and the capability, you know I still think it's more of that Cadillac than it is like say a Lexus. Like someone coming from a Lexus or if you came from an RX or a ES, I mean mm -hmm. it's very much all about being removed and isolated. Right. And while this has that quietness, you know, the steering is pretty darn good. Right, and even the G90, the Genesis G90, the steering's not to the quality of this Continental. Yeah, I mean it's not a it's not a handling kind of car. Mm -hmm. I mean it's a cushy uh, cruiser right. uh, in very much in the traditional American kind of way. And I mean, it remains to be seen, you know, really how many customers are there to really aspire for that kind of thing. No, definitely. Now, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that are done very well in this Continental. I mean, the interior is very nice. Uh, thank goodness it's Sync Three nowadays instead of my Lincoln Touch. Oh, although I do have a problem oh. with, with with the well, controls, yes. and it's the shifter. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> so so in this car. The shifter is, it's like they took away the presets and they relabeled them the Prindle, right? So, I mean, instead of presets, there's park, reverse. I mean, it's fine trying to do something different if it works. But what really gets me is when you take away something and replace it with the shifter. Mm. And we see this all the time, right? So this is the presets. I mean, it really looks like these are the presets for the thing, and that's the shifter. We have other cars where they remove the, the turn signal and that's the shifter, or they remove the, mm -hmm. the wipers and it's the mm -hmm. shifter, or the, the, the radio knob and that's mm -hmm. suddenly the shifter. I mean, come on. I mean, to give it a little bit of credit, <laughs> at least compared to like the uh, MKZ and the MKC, <clears throat> they've given you more space between the touch screen and the, the row buttons. So but, but, but when it, you brace against the, the side to use the screen, but yeah, you, you have to search grouped. for the, yeah. It's grouped, I mean, you look at it, so it's almost a logical group, like here's the radio and here's mm -hmm. the controls for the radio and oh no those aren't the controls for the radio. What do you think of the door handles? They, they're pretty. They are pretty. I mean clearly that is something that's like wow let's do something that as soon as you get to the car it's a little bit different mm -hmm. and it looks interesting it looks like part of the molding. And inside it's like a Corvette you know you've got the push button but, to but, release but the doors those, and an emergency yeah, release. I'm not, I'm not crazy about but, that. But, 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 you but have to it, that. It's, it's like they're trying to do something to be different and we see this sure. from a lot of automakers. It's not any better it doesn't work any better mm -hmm. than a normal door handle. In fact, for the you know getting out, you know it's great. Every time you have somebody in your car and they're you have like, to explain you have where to the button is, especially yeah. at night, mm -hmm. it's like, oh no, that little light thing there, and they press that, the thing you can't read unless you get your head way down. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but they're trying mm -hmm. to be different. The seats are a little weird too. They've got these like wings. Yeah, they, they look very expensive. But they look weird, but they actually work. You, you know? think? I, uh, I, I found I, them a bit narrow. I, I was. Uh, I, I, I was pretty happy in, in, in the seat, yeah. Yeah, I found it a bit narrow. I am. I'm I mean, I was, uh, I was a little struck by how uh, high the cowl is. You're very mm. surrounded with it's you know, a chunk very of a car. tall partitions around. I mean, you. this isn't a chip off of the block. It's the whole block. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot here. I am frustrated that you're spending you know, over. Yeah, this car's fifty-six thousand uh, dollars. We couldn't find one with the two-point-seven in all-wheel drive and. The safety, you know, Ford collision warning, automatic emergency braking. The tech package. It's frustrating to me that this stuff is still optional in it, it, this it's, day when it's standard on a Corolla and this is Ford's yeah, flagship. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, certainly we could have got it if we wound up getting the higher engine and the performance, this or whatever. But it, that's nuts. You know, like you said, yeah, the two seven is plenty. You don't need but, the. And, and, but, and it's the typical yeah. engine for this car. Yeah. But if yeah. you go and you right, like you said, if you bought a Corolla or a Rav Four or a, you know, a, you're going to get the safety stuff standard, you're going to get automatic emergency braking. Mm -hmm. And a brand new flagship to make it optional. And I hope going forward they'll, they'll, they'll put them in more of the bottom line. I mean, we, we go out and we buy the very first ones, right. so we don't have, we don't, we, we only look at the market right now. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, I mean, the only way we could have gotten that basic safety stuff that almost everyone is getting now, wow, we would have to wind up with a powertrain with yeah, with a three liter, with a four hundred horsepower, with the so some so so if you care about safety, 60, if you care about safety, yeah. get the fastest. You got to get the, the the super big horsepower engine. It yeah. doesn't make sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the Alfa Romeo Giulia. Now, now we're talking. That's right. Now we're talking. Um, it, well, I mean, people have been talking about Alfa coming back to America for, for about fifteen years. Forever. I mean, it's almost <clears> as long <throat> as they teased the Pontiac Solstice. Right. You know, every show for five years, Solstice, 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 and then, but Alpha <laughs> is finally back. I mean, they had the 4C, which you know, was kind of a go-kart that not many people bought, but now there's a mass market sedan. Right, so the 4C is uh, very esoteric, uh, but with the Julia, they are aiming right at the heart of the sports sedan market. Right uh, at the BMW, the BMW 3 Series, 3 series yeah. Audi A4, Mercedes C-Class. And uh, the, the other shoe is going to be the SUV, the Stelvio which is probably going to outsell the Julia about 10 to 1. You know, did, is the world asking for an Alfa Romeo SUV? The world's asking for SUVs. Yes. Uh, and anyone who wants to sell cars has to sell an SUV. Has to sell an SUV. Ba yeah. Back to the Julia. Back to the Julia. Okay. So. <laughs> Cheer me up. No, the car, is, I mean, first of all, it looks dynamite. Um, it, uh, it drives, I mean, it really is fun to drive. I mean, steering is very, very, very steering good. Steering is, is quick yeah. uh, without being nervous. The car is, is tied down. It's, uh, it just puts a smile on your face. The sound is great, and if you dial into the right modes. Yeah, you know. they're one of the few companies that actually, when you change the modes in a car, it really feels something. They yeah. call it their DNA, and it works surprisingly well. Yeah, it works beautifully. Your thoughts? On the Alpha. Yeah, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a long time since we've seen a real Alpha here. And even back before when Alpha was here, they had with a Roadster, I mean, the 164, way, way back. Yeah, the back. 164 was an odd ball but, car. But, but, I mean, they have been, I mean, I, I, at one point I was living in Europe and I was driving a 156, mm -hmm. you know, and this was like a more contemporary Alpha. Right. And it was a fabulous car. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a really, really enjoyable to drive car. And, um, yeah, I think we're seeing that again. So, so the, the new Julia, it is a very enjoyable car to drive. The issue for it is it is a crowded market. Uh -huh. BMW 3 Series is very good and has a big following. The Audi A4 is a fantastic car, car yes. and reliable too. Mm -hmm. And reliable, let's pause there. <laughs> reliable and alpha. Huh. And I'm not sure. <laughs> well, obviously, we don't have a lot of, you know, alphas here. But, I mean, again, it's from Fiat Chrysler. I mean, this is... A company uh, that has struggled to make reliable yeah, cars. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, sure, maybe it's, it's a little bit different, or maybe the steering is a little bit better than the BMW 3 Series. But when you have a car with questionable reliability, I mean, again, again, don't, don't get me wrong. We don't have data for those cars just coming out. But... Um, the reputation and the data that we do have for anything from Fiat Chrysler and what we know about a new vehicle to market mm -hmm. and all of the opportunities to have something go wrong, wow, it's really a risky purchase for you know, maybe a little bit more style, maybe a little bit you know, nicer steering. Yeah, whatever. Sure. I mean, it's anyone's guess if it's going to hold up together. But you know, this Some market segment <laughs> uh, is, uh, I mean, leasing is very popular mm -hmm. in this segment. And if you're someone who leases these cars and you're kind of rotate BMW, Audi, Mercedes. Mm. So uh, for um, you know, just to be a little different, you might be tempted to go uh, with an Alpha and, uh, and you know, it's, it's pretty enjoyable. I mean, but also, to just expand on what you, Jake, said, uh, it's the first Alpha that's a real Alpha, trying to like, get back to the glory days. Legit, rear-wheel drive mm -hmm. uh, Alpha, not uh, front-wheel drive, not something that's based on the Fiat platform that's more plebeian. Right, now, um, it is a bit smaller then uh, you don't get the interior space of a 3 Series. You know, it's, it's a, you know it's, it is trying very hard to be a close-coupled, sporty sedan. I mean, it succeeds at that very well. Yeah. Um, if we'll, see if, we'll see if the marketplace place accepts it. Uh, it certainly has been a long time in waiting. Uh, so now we're going to get to some questions and comments. You know, <clears throat> I always wonder, when people ask us for car advice, do they actually buy anything? Or do they follow our advice? We have the we have an answer oh. from our last show. Fascinating. Remember, someone asked about buying a Roadster, um, you know, with, with modern safety equipment. 
Oh, the LX San Francisco. Yeah, Miata. yeah, I was going to, yeah. So we found out what he bought. Jim Lee writes, I bought a 2012 Miata folding hardtop for now, a 20 grand to hold me over. It's not the most comfortable, but a blast to drive and high smiles for gown. Hopefully with someone, something will come up soon before my back starts hurting with Ford collision and autonomous braking in a Roadster or convertible. Oh, so you're, yeah, he's going to have fun. But uh, yeah, I mean, like we said, the marketplace is hard. There aren't many roadsters or convertibles that are affordable that have all the safety equipment. Next, uh, we had some comments about the, uh, talking about the Subaru Impreza. That jazz guy writes, I think CR still fails to understand that there are some people for whom a fully loaded vehicle make, like a $29,000 Impreza makes sense. If you keep your car a long time, more than five to six years, Extras that add to the comfort and usability of the vehicle can make perfect sense. I think what he was going at was that I said a $29,000 Impreza was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And it is a lot of money. I, 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 well, don't, I don't disagree. Well, I mean, look, I mean, it, it's, it's true. I mean, you look at those, that segment and it can get pricey. I mean, the other thing that we talk about, too, is if you're looking at a luxury vehicle, getting a more pedestrian car with the options, you're getting a lot of that luxury mm -hmm. too. So I mean, in a way, he's got himself a, you know, a budget car that has the luxury he wants. And, right. and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Well, let, let's acknowledge <clears throat> that for a lot of people, price per square footage of a car is, is a thing. Totally. And, uh, but I mean, there are people that for them, the actual the compact footprint <clears throat> of the car is a value in, in its own right, and they're willing to pay for that. Yeah, no, I was thinking about that. Uh, Thanksgiving week I spent in Europe, uh, in Britain, with my in-laws, uh, where there was not Thanksgiving, but all the same. Uh, we drove around. We were thankful anyway. Yeah, we were thankful. Uh, we drove around in my father-in-law's Volkswagen Golf, four adults and our luggage. And you know, we all fit, and it's easy to park. And the car feels mature and grown up. You know, I mean, uh, I actually can understand, uh, you know, getting a loaded Impreza. That would be a sort of car or a loaded Golf, uh, which isn't as reliable. Um, I mean, that would be the sort of car I personally would buy. But I don't have kids. You know, I I have this sort of Eurocentric background. <coughs> yeah. I can I can understand it, but there's a reason why loaded versions of these cars are only five or ten percent of their model mix. But 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 again, I mean, you're talking about four adults in a car. How often? How often does anyone drive that way? Mm. I mean, I do have kids, and you know what? They're fine in the back of a Golf. They're fine in the back. My wife's got a Prius. They're fine in the back there. Mm. I mean, how much room do they really need? Right. And um, <clears throat> they're fine. They're closer to talk to it. It's mm. all good. He's right. I mean, my, my kids were pretty happy in the back of the CT6 this Thanksgiving weekend. I, 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 well, again, last <laughs> better be happy in the back of well, the CT6. Last night I was in the Continental with the, with the boys, and you know, I'm like screaming at them, like, can you hear me back there? And they're like, no, Dad. I thought the car was quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of the Impreza, uh, that, when we did that episode, we were talking, we had a pair of press cars, and we were talking about the term rented. And someone asks us uh, mm -hmm. to explain that. Colin Heath says, you keep saying rented when referring to the press cars. Why do you rent them? Aren't they meant to be for you to test? So, yes. Yeah, so I, I guess I would like to ask the audience, is there a better term they would use? And, and here's the story. Where they're not our vehicles, mm -hmm. all the cars that we test, we purchase because we want to make sure that we have a representative car. We don't rely on anything that's handed to us from the manufacturers. We use the term rented because they lend us the car. We pay for that use. That's why we put rented. Renting, of course, means you know we're not going to Avis to get the uh, <laughs> to get the prototype, the Subaru. prototype <laughs> Subaru or whatever it is. Yeah, pre-production uh, Alfa Romeo because yeah, you can't really do that. So yeah, I mean, I, I, there's got to be a better way of presenting mm -hmm. it. They're, they're manufacturer cars, um, yeah, and, I mean, and we're not getting them for free. That's yeah, what we're that's trying to the say. big difference. Most publications <clears throat> are not. The New York Times pays something, but otherwise, <clears throat> most publications don't pay anything for press cars. Right. And, and, we we want to be in a position where we don't get any uh, freebies from the manufacturers, but we still want to have some content on cars before we actually buy them and test them. Uh, for a formal road test. And right. it comes up in our conversation very often because we want to make, one, the point that this is a not a purchased car, so everything with a little bit of a grain of salt, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not going to, that's why you're not going to see numbers on these, these, these uh, on the borrowed cars. That's right. That's why we're not running zero to 60 numbers. We're right. not making, we're not making definitive uh, scores on noise or right. ride or things like right. that. So, is it good? There's other things we learn by buying our own test cars, too. Uh, this is our 
third Lincoln Continental? Yes. <laughs> you yes. want to explain that? Uh, oh my goodness. So yeah, so we wanted to get the first Lincoln Continental we could find, and and you know, I mean, Gabe, you, you run that program. You you scour, and make sure that we get these cars soon, which is terrific. Um, the problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so the person who was assigned to buy the Continental uh, got to the dealer and they uh, felt for some, uh, re so some reason the car wasn't ready. The didn't, dealer did. Yes, the dealer did and didn't want to deliver it. Um, and so that deal was well, canceled. At that point, we were already not anon anon anonymous that we were consumer reports because we like to buy the cars completely um, anonymous. So, so we got in a so, situation where, uh, so when we purchased the car, we don't tell them who we are. But we got in a situation, they knew where we were, we were ready to pick it up, and they're just like, hold on, wait, we want to fix this and that, and that's not quite right, and, we, and you made the right call, and you were like. Right, yeah, our cover is blown. Okay, Bye -bye. let's start from, from the beginning. <laughs> we're going now, to another deal. Maybe sure. they would have done that with any other customer, but we were concerned that it was us. And we were, don't want a car that's been doctored or anything special happened to it. So that brings us to Continental number two. And then we went out of state. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so the person who was assigned to buy that went to Massachusetts to buy the car there. And on the way back, it overheated and he got stranded. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Ford says uh, that uh, a hose, a coolant hose wasn't clamped right and the car leaked coolant and uh, that's uh, how it lost the uh, coolant, got overheated and uh, the car did its right thing. It gave the, the right warnings. It, it went into a limp home mode. Uh, nevertheless, it was a huge inconvenience. Uh, we also made a decision then Okay, I mean, just on the off chance of some damage to the car, we don't want that car to be our official test car. Right. So the dealer uh, agreed to buy it back from us, and they came and, um, and took it back. So um, here we go, Lincoln well, Continental Lincoln number three. Lincoln Continental number three. Right, so I mean, that was an interesting case because, I mean, I think that was the first time ever that the car didn't make it to our facility to the mm -hmm. track yeah. without breaking down. I mean, not to say this is going to be an unreliable car. I don't know that. This is probably one of the very first cars that was off the line. We're, we're certainly not, it doesn't influence our reliability rating. We're doing this from all the data that we get. But it does show that, wow, if you want to be the very first one in your block to get a car, eh, maybe wait a month. Yeah. <laughs> let, let, them, let them figure out how to put the, uh, the, 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 uh, the hoses on better. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let, let someone else work out all the bugs. Yeah. Actually, you know, we also reached out to Ford. They apologized for the inconvenience. They said the car responded the way it was supposed to given the situation, and they said it was an isolated case and not a trend. Yeah. That is going to wrap it up for this episode of Talking Cars. As always, we thank you for listening and watching. We'll see you again next time.